I ask partly because some people might be like, well, she's funded by NIGMS, the mm-hmm. General Medical Sciences. Her you know, work, work is in sepsis. Like that sounds very like biomedical heavy. But as a PICU nurse, we know, you know, there and there are lots of different mm-hmm. ICU nurses and people listening who kind of have a similar shared experience as us. But being in the PICU, we know it's a medically heavy environment mm-hmm. where there's still an enormous nursing uh, presence and a huge role for nursing care. Absolutely. Which may be an understatement, I think. Um, but they might be wondering, like, well, she's funded by a medical institute doing what sounds like medical research. I just wanted you to expand on that part because well, I think I mean, the nursing and I think that's the thing is important. the next step is to create interventions to optimize these children's recovery, right? Mm. Like nursing based interventions. If we're able to recognize which children are most at risk, we can optimize that recovery, whether that be inpatient in the nursing side that we're doing, or even follow up. You know, nursing follow up has been shown in adult populations with sepsis to be one of the biggest predictors of recovery in, in older adults in sepsis. Um, there's a research study out of Penn that's looking at that. Um, so nursing is really important to this, and I think our we have to solidify our role in that. And but we have to understand the underlying mechanisms that we can modulate and um, mediate to really impact that recovery. Mm. Welcome to the Clinical Appraisal Podcast. My name is Ian Lane, and on this show, we discuss the science and theory of nursing. I'm a critical care nurse and PhD student in nursing science focused on measurement and methodology. Importantly, nothing I say constitutes nursing advice. This is education only. And if you want to get in touch with me, please email me at clinicalappraisal at gmail.com. If you want to donate to the show, links are in the description, and otherwise, like, comment, subscribe, and share the show if you enjoyed this episode. So Mallory is a friend of mine from the School of Nursing and a fellow PICU nurse at Connecticut Children's with me. She's doing some fabulous research, and uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about her work in sepsis, but mostly I want to talk a little bit about how she got here. So why don't you take a quick second to introduce our listeners to who you are, and what your kind of core interests are, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Um, my name is Mallory Perry Eady. I am a nurse scientist and assistant professor here at UConn. I still work in the PICU at Connecticut Children's. Um, I am a triple husky, so I got my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD all from UConn. And um, right after I got my bachelor's, I started working at Connecticut Children's. So I'm going on 10 years next year working in the PICU. Um, and I just love it. I love helping critically ill children and their families. Isn't it crazy how fast time it flies? It went really, really quickly. You know, <laughs> really I quickly. only switched into nursing a couple of years ago. And really? I've already been a nurse for almost two years. It flies. It really does and fly. You look crazy. back and you're like, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah. So weird. So um, that's awesome. And you're back now as faculty. I am. Um, so what are you working on? And then we can kind of... Yeah, research-wise? Yeah, yeah. Sure. So my research currently is funded by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. And what I'm looking at is trying to understand survivorship in children who survive the ICU, particularly those who have sepsis, um, sepsis and or pneumonia. And what we're trying to understand is is there a role of inflammation that impacts the way that they recover. So does early inflammation um, predict or is it associated with worse functional outcomes um, months after ICU discharge is really what we're trying to figure out right now. Okay. So kind of looking at like the SERS response type Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. So we're trying to understand if that systemic um, inflammatory response, if that actually has any bearing on the way these children recover when they get home, does it impact functional status in the sense of the way they play, the way they talk, the way they interact with their environments. Nice. So this is you 10 years into nursing. And so let's backtrack. Um, I want to know, first of all, what made you want to become a nurse? But then I'll ask you what made you want to become a nurse scientist. So we'll go. Yeah, from absolutely. First. So I, nursing kind of came to, it just kind of fell in my lap. It wasn't like I had this whole long line of family of nurses. Um, I have to, do have two aunts who are nurses, but that never was something that was super like, I need to do this. I always thought growing up that I wanted to be a lawyer, but then I realized, um, you actually have to like win to like, get paid. And so and be a um, little disagreeable. Well, I'm very disagreeable anyway, so <laughs> that was fine. But um, what happened was, is my, I went to an all girls high school and um, we had to do a senior project. And I did a project at this women's center where we provided um, 
layette. So like um, they were things for the families once they had the child. So diapers, blankets, things like that. And so I got to interact with these families. It made me realize I do like helping kind of those who are most vulnerable and that being children and their families. And so that spurred me to look into nursing programs. Um, at the time, what landed me at UConn was actually I was playing basketball. I played basketball my entire life um, and I was going to play in college. But then obviously I am only five eight, and so I wasn't <laughs> going to play here at UConn. Mm -hmm. And so I got offers from some other schools, but really the UConn nursing program stood out to me. And so I had to kind of give up that dream a little bit and That's go cool. into nursing. I never knew that about you, yeah, actually. I did. Yeah. My whole life. Awesome. So, you know, you get into UConn School of Nursing, you're taking courses, you're doing your thing. And was there a certain point where you met somebody that influenced you to do research? Like, how did you come across research? Because most yeah. nursing students are like... I yeah. couldn't imagine doing that. Like, what triggered you? Yeah, so I wish I could say it was some transformative moment, but I was in the honors program, and I've been in the honors program since I was a freshman. And as a part of the honors program, we're required to do a research project. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, you know, when I started the honors program, only two of us, maybe three of us, were in the honors program. Um, because, like you're saying, a lot of people were like, why would you want to do that, nurses? Why are you doing research? And honestly, you know, 17, 18-year-old Mal was thinking, you know, I can pick my clinical first if I'm in the honors program. So that really was what that started off as. But I started to get into it. I was really interested in the intricacies of finding out the processes behind things. And my first research project, I was working with Dr. Michelle Judge, who um, is a scientist here in the School of Nursing and Nutrition. And what we were understanding was, is the influence of omega-3 fatty acids in women who have, collegiate women, who have premenstrual syndrome, and really trying to understand if omega-3 fatty acids impacted their pain and the way they process pain um, during PMS. And what we found with that is that it was not beneficial, but it wasn't harmful. It was, it was just nice and even keeled. Um, but that really got me into the inflammation field and kind of research and being interested in that. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. is, is that the tie in with pain and Angela? Too, exactly. The yeah. And... So then when I got my um, bachelor's, like I said, I went and worked at um, the PICU and I was really interested because at the time we, we don't have them anymore, but we were getting our spinal fusion post-ops mm -hmm. regularly to the PICU. Um, There's an entire protocol um, that these children would come for extra monitoring. I've seen none of them. Exactly. So, <laughs> and literally by the time I got my, um, IRB, it changed, and so it really changed my, my project idea. But I was really wondering why some kids do really well after surgery. You know, they're up within 24 hours, they're sitting, they're walking the next day, whereas some kids, the pain was unbearable and they were not able to move. We could not get them out of bed. Mm. And I really wanted to know what was it inherently, um, was it a biological process, was it psychosocial that was leading to this, right? And so that's what got me into that um, pain area and looking at um, persistent post-operative pain. Mm. So... Angela, I had Angela on the podcast, Angela oh, yeah. Starkweather, that's um, the Dean of Research or the, the Director of the PhD program now, I think, at University of Florida. Mm -hmm. She's awesome. She was here at UConn for a long time, and she is awesome. I completely agree. So you must have had maybe a class with her or... So it's funny. So yeah. Angela and I actually... So when I started my PhD program... Um, I was admitted and I was going to be working with Dr. Deborah McDonald, um, who I'd worked with in my undergraduate too, who's also awesome. She does adult pain. Um, and so when I came in, they were like, you know what? We had this new faculty member coming in. We think you might be a good fa uh, fit with her. And I was like, okay, I don't know who she is. And I met Angela and it was just like the the best I don't know, interaction. And we just clicked. And she is someone that I still talk to. This, I just talked to her last week. Um, you know, she's someone that's a great mentor. And even though, you know, she does adult pain, I do pediatric pain, she certainly was able to help me kind of get to where I am today. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. What was it about the research process that you were like, this this grips me. Yeah, it's it's that intricacies. I think being an ICU nurse, we're so detail oriented. <laughs> yeah. So I think understanding the underlying processes is what's most important to me because we see the after, but what is causing that after? Because we're doing so many interventions can we change the way we're doing interventions to really help a patient population? Um, not every child is not a one size fits all modality, right? And so I really wanted to know what was that underlying piece that led to these um, dysfunctions mm -hmm. or these pain profiles. Kind of the mechanistic. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Underpinnings. Exactly. Okay. Tell me from there what your kind of next steps were in terms of your, 
your research journey? Yeah. So I got my PhD looking at the spinal fusion population, and we looked at um, biomarkers of inflammation um, using RNA-seq and expression profiles to really understand um, which children were most at risk or most associated with having those poor uh, pain profiles and outcomes. Mm -hmm. I had a very, very small sample size. Um, I collected about 20 children from CCMC, and I collaborated with Christine Seberg at Boston Children's, who was amazing, who was doing similar work. We were able to kind of collaborate. We have a few papers out on that. Though what we both found is these inflammatory profiles. So that being said, um, I pursued a postdoctoral fellowship because I knew I needed additional training because my... Uh, spinal fusion work, like I mentioned, right after I got my IRB, the kids were no longer coming to the ICU. So it took me out of the ICU. I was doing all my stuff in the ortho clinic, and I really wanted to get back to my critically ill children and their families. So my postdoc fellowship was specifically in critical care. So I worked with Dr. Martha Curley at Penn and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, who was doing critical care research in children with acute respiratory failure um, in children who are on ventilators. Yeah. So um, a lot of those kids end up having sepsis, which I talked about inflammation. Sepsis is obviously an inflammatory process. So I started getting more into the inflammation side of things, working with Martha and Dr. Scott Weiss, who is now at Nemours Children's, um, who is a sepsis expert, has written the sepsis guidelines and the pathways for recovery of sepsis. And so I had just a really great experience um, and able to work in their existing data sets and kind of play around and kind of figure out these different genetic profiles, as well as inflammatory profiles that may impact outcomes. Mm. So I just want to point out for people who are watching that, you know, most of the people who know about nursing research think of nurse scientists as people who do like qualitative studies Mm -hmm. with small to moderate sized samples on kind of these big like psychosocial questions and all that stuff is very important. And some of those individuals are doing really phenomenal work and it's really important hypothesis generating work. So I have endless positive things to say about qualitative Mm -hmm. research too it's hard (laughs) but there are nurses out here doing research that are focused on more biobehavioral stuff more mechanistic research um tell me a little bit about your experience as somebody who identifies as this like mechanistic researcher in this kind of pool of nurse scientists across the country across the world who are doing different types of research like do you have um kind of an outsider type of experience in that sense and if like, yeah, what's that been like for yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. I often tell people, like, I'm often an N of one in a lot of the spaces that I'm in. A lot of the spaces I'm in are often um, very, you know, physician scientist heavy, or they're very PhD heavy who have that basic science background. Mm-hmm. So I think being a nurse scientist, you're able to bring this holistic approach to these basic science types questions um, and really bringing back the human aspect to it, which obviously physicians do and PhDs do as well. But we just have a different lens that we're thinking about when mm-hmm. we think about this. Um, But in a lot of spaces I've been in, um, I usually am the only nurse who's doing this research, which is really cool to teach other people about, yeah, like nurses do this too. But we also, like you're saying, have that qualitative piece to it. Like I'm interested in outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that's that quality of life, like that whole aspect, not really mortality, I'm more in the morbidity space. Mm. Um, So it's, it's really interesting. And it is often a solo endeavor, but you're able to kind of forge this own path that you like. Yeah, and I'm sure you have like built different types of connections. Like you were talking about the sepsis experts. At Absolutely. And... The the main thing is having a mentorship team. Mm-hmm. Um, I have sepsis experts. I have biomarker experts. Dr. Mary um, Dahmer out of University of Michigan, Heidi Flory. They help me with my biomarker stuff. I have statistical support. Um, I, you know, I've got. I'm trying to get into the sleep realm now. I'm working with Sapna Kuchikar at um, Johns Hopkins and Nancy Redeker here at UConn. So it's creating teams of experts because I've got that nursing piece but I'm needing those other pieces to really kind of build my questions and make them more robust. Mm. Because I have an idea, but it needs to be more robust. Yeah. Say more about this idea that, like, you, as a nurse scientist, even though sometimes you're doing, like, biomarker-based research or doing research in the lab, how, you know, you come across, let's say, a microbiologist or a molecular biologist or something, your lens is different, obviously, you know, as a function of you being trained as a nurse, you Mm -hmm. know, like, Say more about that experience, too. Absolutely. I mean, I think about, back to my dissertation, when one of the questions I was asked by one of my um, committee members was, because I was doing peripheral blood samples in these children, um, we're looking at pain profiles. They were like, well, why weren't you doing spinal tissue? 
well, I don't think, you know, parents and their <laughs> families are going to allow me to take spinal tissue from these children, yeah. right? So it's, you know, it's thinking outside of the box and looking at proxies um, for some of the very mechanistic things that we're thinking of without burdening families. Mm. And I think that the nursing lens really has that thought of like, how can we answer this question in the most robust way possible without causing more harm? I'm not an animal scientist, so I don't do anything mm. with mice, right? So it's all human. How can we protect this child protect their family and not cause additional burden while answering the questions that we need. Totally. I ask partly because some people might be like, well, she's funded by NIGMS, the mm-hmm. general medical sciences. Her you know, work, work is in sepsis. Like that sounds very like biomedical heavy, but as a PICU nurse, we know, you know, there, and there are lots of different mm-hmm. ICU nurses and people listening who kind of have a similar shared experience as us. But being in the PICU, we know it's a, medically heavy environment Mm -hmm. where there's still an enormous nursing uh, presence and a huge role for nursing care. Absolutely. Which may be an understatement, I think. Um, But they might be wondering, like, well, she's funded by a medical institute doing what sounds like medical research. I just wanted you to expand on that part because I think... I mean, and I think that's the thing is the next step is to create interventions to optimize these children's recovery, right? Mm. Like nursing-based interventions. If we're able to recognize which children are most at risk... We can optimize that recovery, whether that be inpatient and the nursing side that we're doing, or even follow up. You know, nursing follow up has been shown in adult populations with sepsis to be one of the biggest predictors of recovery in in older adults in sepsis. Um, There's a research study out of Penn that's looking at that. Um, So nursing is really important to this. And I think our we have to solidify our role in that. And but we have to understand the underlying mechanisms that we can modulate and um, mediate to really impact that recovery. Mm. So let's um, flash forward again just a little bit. Mm-hmm. So now you did a postdoc. You spent two years? A year? Um, two year years. Oh, well, no. Three years. Okay. How did I? Yeah, three years. Three years total. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so you did this postdoc. You expanded your research. You built that network. And then you came back here. Mm-hmm. You're now faculty with what we call a kangaroo award. K99ROO. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and so... It's kind of like that nice bridge for you between postdoc and faculty. Now you're assistant professor. I kind of summarize so that I can ask you this question, which is you're still considered an early career investigator, yes. even though you're a badass, clearly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how do you feel being an, er, a new investigator, new faculty? Like, what are some of the hurdles that you deal with? Yeah, so being early career, there are a lot of pressures, right? So in academia, you your name is by your presentations, your, your publications, and so there's a lot of pressure to kind of stay on top of that while also doing your research, which is very time consuming, getting to know these families, follow up with these families, talking to the nurses, making sure they understand the research and the validity of it and why it's important. Because if you don't have nurse buy-in, you're not gonna get what you need, right? Mm-hmm. And so it, that's very time intensive. Then it's writing the results, that's time intensive. And then I'm also teaching. Um, and so it's it's a lot to balance and especially being early career. But I think the most important thing is mentorship and getting a team of mentors to really, really help you with that. And I'm very fortunate because I, I built my network at CHOP Um, though my kangaroo award, my K99 is, um, it's funded through NIGMS, but it's called a mosaic award. So it's very unique that it's not like the regular K99. It is a cohort based model. So a cohort of us were selected from all different institutes. And I think my cohort, there's like five or six of us. And so we kind of all were postdocs together. I'm the only neuroscientist. There's like two physicians and the rest are PhDs. And um, we were all able to go on the job market together. So we were able to bounce ideas off each other. We meet um, about monthly and have like programming. Um, We're actually, our programming is by the double AMC, which is the American Academy of Medical Colleges. Mm -hmm. So once again, I'm in a medical college institute and um, I'm, I'm not a medical person, but um, it's a lot to learn from them and them learning from me, which has been a great, it's just been a great experience, um, that cohort type vibe. Mm-hmm. And like I was telling you, um, at UConn, I was hired a part of a cohort as well. There's five of us new junior faculty that kind of came in together. So it's been very nice to have that support. Support and mentorship is kind of the biggest thing mm. I can say for an early career person. That's fantastic. Yeah. So as you think about all these collaborative relationships you've built with medical people, what's the thing that you think you bring to the table that's more unique to your nursing training that you're going to bring to them? Because I think it's easier for people to associate medicine 
because they see things in Hollywood, all the TV shows, the movies. We are not represented in Hollywood well, if at all, generally speaking. So, like, a lot of people just don't understand what nurses do, or let alone what nurse researchers and nurse scientists do, right? So tell people what you think you bring to the team. I think it's that holistic approach. It's looking from, it's it's translation. It's simply bench to bedside to home. Mm. Um, you know, I'm looking at the, the basic level of blood inflammatory markers to the whole child and then how that impacts the family as well. Because as we know in pediatrics, family-centered care is at the crux of what we do. Um, I mean, if the kid doesn't have a good family environment, that child's going to be impacted by that and have negative outcomes as well. So we're looking at the whole gamut. We're looking at the child um, social function, economic status, as well as school. And because we know a child's main job is school and it's school or it's play, depending on this child's developmental status. So we're looking at the whole child Mm. and not to say that the other disciplines don't do that. I think they do, but oftentimes it's very um, a narrow focus on like, you know, I'm looking at the inflammation as a whole, but they're looking at a specific gene at the specific loci and really trying to figure out like that low science seeing like what's happening. I'm looking at inflammation as a whole and how mm. that can impact the child. Yeah. I love that you just said uh, bench to bedside to home. Mm-hmm. I've never heard anybody say it like that before, but you know, you emphasize the holism part of it. Mm-hmm. And I frequently hear translational scientists talk about bench to bedside research because that's like the shtick, right? Mm-hmm. But I've never heard anybody say, and then to home, which ties into your research nicely, right? Because Mm -hmm. you are interested in rehabilitation from post-sepsis, post-SERS, inflammatory response. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. No, no, it is. Based on what you've told me before. Um, I feel like that's really unique to what we do. Well, it is. And the, the biggest, like... The defining moment of my career when I realized I wanted to do kind of like post ICU and figuring out what that was is um, I had a patient who had a very devastating injury. um, And, you know, I'm thinking like this kid's probably going to be neurologically devastated, really unable to really walk again, things of that nature, not able to really talk clearly. And then after, you know, we, we helped this kid, we got him to recover. Oftentimes in the PICU, I mean, I don't know if you see it, we don't get kids to come back. We're not like the NICU where like the graduates come back, it's this mm-hmm. whole thing. Our kids don't usually come back, whether it's because of their they got PTSD from the PICU or I they just don't want to remember that, you know, so they don't come back. So we don't really ever see kind of what happens. Mm. Um, so that being said, this kid came back and I was like, and he was walking, he was talking. I mean, he had some deficits, but I mean, I couldn't have imagined that he would be at the level that he was at. And so that really, you know, points to the fact that kids are resilient, but we don't have really a systematic way of characterizing what that after looks like. Mm. And so that's really what I'm interested in understanding. Yeah, yeah well, because everybody who's doing sepsis research, I don't know this for a fact, but it, I imagine they're all interested in how do we acutely get them to not die right. from sepsis mm-hmm. and then get the heck out of the ICU and then go about their life. But then, you know, there are so few of you who are like, well, wait a second, what happens once they leave? Yeah, I and mean, how do they recover? a lot of it's mortality based and it's figuring out like when's the best time, when's the best antibiotic, what's the best drug, mm. um, things like that. But I will say there was one large study that came out called the LAPS trial. It was life after pediatric sepsis um, that came out a few years before COVID. Um, they looked a little bit at some of the quality of life stuff, um, but I'm trying to get like a, a different kind of cohort looking at specific inflammatory markers and they didn't have a control group. So I have a control group in mind. We're trying to compare. Oh. Oh, to cool. see if there's any differences in these children when they recover. That's awesome. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a different take. Very cool. So I'm curious, what is, uh, and this is a little bit of a non sequitur, I hope you don't mind. Yeah. What is the biggest kind of methodological challenge that you've noticed with some of the work that you do? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it is parents understanding research. They don't want their mm-hmm. kid to be a guinea pig, right? Yeah. And um, the one good thing about the research we're doing is it's observational. Um, so the work that we're doing, we're not doing an intervention. We're not giving them a drug. We're not giving them a study, you know, procedure. Um, the only procedure that is done is a um, blood draw, mm-hmm. which we did write in our protocol that they would have a, dr- um, a line of some sort that we can hopefully draw from. Unfortunately, it doesn't work sometimes. And so a lot of times we do get kicked back because parents don't want their kid poked again or the kid themselves. Because we do ask for a cent. The kid themselves may not want to be poked again. Um so, you know, there's, I think it's just understanding the validity of the research, how this may impact. But a lot of people are just truly altruistic and they just want to help. And they're like, absolutely, take my blood. Like, I don't care. So I, it really depends. You know, we've got really good responses so far. We've got like about 10% recruitment and we just started a couple months ago. So um, we're doing pretty well, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah.
in your mind, what's the next step after this uh, K99RO award? Is yeah, it? so next step is going for those big R01 equivalent awards, right? So those are the ones that are most coveted. Those are those million dollar grants. And so, you know, our PICU that I'm doing my research in is a fairly small PICU comparatively. Um, I would love to do multi-center. Um, because a lot of the large PICU studies right now are multi-center. Um, where I came from at CHOP, when I was working on the PICU studies, um, there were 30 plus PICUs mm. that were enrolling patients into these studies. Um, and so that's really where I'm gonna have to go next steps is looking at multi-center for that diversity of not just patients, race, ethnicity, things like that, but also geographical diversity. There's different conditions that might happen in certain regions. Um, more accidents might happen in one region versus another. Um, and SES data. So there's just a lot of things and there's benefits to having this geographic diversity. Yep. And different types of infections have exactly. different prevalence rates at different times in different parts of the exactly. country. And that's interesting. Mm-hmm. That, and you're part of like the PEDS. You just Policy. familiarized this me with this recently. Polici? Oh, no. So there's two things. So Polici is the Pediatric Acute Lung Injury and Sepsis Investigators. Oh, yes. That's an awesome group. So Polici, um, they meet um, twice a year. There's a spring meeting and a fall meeting. Actually, in two weeks, the fall meeting's in Boston. Oh, nice. Um, But there is also the Pediatric Nurse Science, uh, ICU Nurse Scientist Collaborative. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That one's awesome. So that one is more of, so the other one was an interdisciplinary group. This one is specific to pediatric ICU nurses. And we will occasionally have some other specialties like our RTs will be on sometimes, occasionally physicians, but it's usually just neuroscientists in the PICU or people who are interested just in research in the PICU. And um, it's very informal. It meets on a monthly basis and someone will come with, it could be a very formed idea, all the way to a grant proposal, all the way to, this is what I'm thinking, how do I get there? Yeah. And um, it's great because there's a lot of experts in different areas who are on the calls and can kind of chime in and give feedback. Um, yesterday, someone presented um, on her idea that she had submitted for funding and is hopefully getting that funded and just asking about the actual implementation of the study, right? Because mm. it's enough to write a grant, but then having to do the grant, it's like a whole other thing. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. It seems like the network is there for that next step. Mm-hmm. It's just like, you know, chugging along and doing all the all yeah. the writing and all. The... I mean, honestly, all of those multi like studies, those large multi picu studies, a lot of them originate from Polisi, that group I was talking about. Oh, um, a lot of them originate from there. So people will come in with an idea, they'll present it, say who's interested, and then it, it kind of really comes from there. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool, very cool. Now you are trying to balance both teaching and research mm-hmm. in the PICU. You. you have your sepsis study, your K99, R- I'm never going to be able to say this correctly, <laughs> your K99 R01. Yep. I'm just going to say kangaroo award. That's fine. And um, you are somehow balancing or not balancing. Like, <laughs> tell me about how you're balancing teaching along with your research. Like, yeah, it's it's certainly, it's a struggle, um, but it's hiring staff and having people who are able to kind of run the study behind the scenes. Um, on your behalf. Um, it's having a project manager, having a research assistant. So when I'm on my heavy teaching days, like today's one, um, they can kind of run that in the background and then we can check in later and be like, hey, were you able to recruit? Do you need help with processing the samples? Like I can come in and do that, things of that sort. Um, because for me, what's very important is teaching. So I never really want to let that kind of backslide. So I'll hire the help with the research part um, because they've got it, like they've been trained in that. And then like, I'm here to teach the students with the next generation of nurses. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you you had a GA ship or a TA ship or both? Um, so both, were... both okay. during my uh, my PhD. <laughs> I wasn't sure because uh, a lot of people who do like the G the RA ship mm-hmm. did I say GA ship the RA ship um, they end up getting a lot of exposure to the lab, a mm-hmm. lot of exposure to different methods. They're really engaged in the in their mentor's work, and then they get out and they get their first assistant professorship, and they're like, oh my, God, I haven't actually taught like a course. How do yeah, I do it? Like, I'm, I'm very grateful that I was able to teach during my my uh, PhD work. So mm-hmm. the first three years, I did a GA, RA type ship with Angela. So I worked in her lab, which was awesome. So I got the hands-on lab work, doing RNA extraction, doing aliquiding, things like that, um, and recruiting patients. And then my final year, I got into the teaching in the lab. And then I also had a couple clinical groups, which was awesome. Mm. So I'm very grateful that I had that experience because um, it really helps me today <laughs> as I'm teaching students. Yeah. I guess it's different too for nurses like my previous graduate work was in neuroscience and statistics Mm. and like you don't you know as nurses in the PICU and and really in any floor in the hospital you're teaching you're precepting all the time so (laughs) you do have experience teaching even outside of academia Mm -hmm. too 
um, which I bet gives it kind of an interesting edge teaching nursing students when you've taught nurses who have come out as new grads. Too. It does. It does. And I, and it's funny because now that I'm working, I'm still working in the PICU. Now I'm working with some of the individuals that I taught <laughs> here at UConn <laughs> during my, really cool. my GA. So um, it's nice to kind of see it come full circle, which is what really makes me happy is that I'm really helping these future nurses because you know one day I'm gonna get sick and like I need someone to take care of me right so you are not the first person that has really? said that recently <laughs> to me and it's but it's so true like yeah you it's something you think about after you know 30 32 35 mm-hmm. like you get to a point where you're like oh you know I'm gonna get is, sick one day. <laughs> yeah exactly I want to make sure that they're well prepared to be able to do that and someone's like oh like Mallory taught them not like oh god Mallory taught them like you know <laughs> <laughs> um so what has been the biggest um, learning curve for, for your teaching side? Um, for my teaching side. So it's been the biggest learning curve, I think, is the variety of courses we have to teach, right? Mm. So um, this, my first teaching assignment, which was last uh, last year, I taught intro to nursing, which was, um, it was interesting. I mean, I love the students, the material itself. Like I kind of had to kind of refresh, refresh myself yep. because yep. a lot of it was nursing history. Um, and so I'm like, okay, um, all right, there's Florence. We're like, where is she in the grand <laughs> scheme of like this? And like, oh, also Florence, not really in love with that. Let's talk more about, you know, Mary Mahoney, Mary Siegel. So like, you know, adding the diversity to it because a lot of times like that's not really introduced into programs. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just because of this is how nursing is, I think, historically. So I was, it's nice I'm able to kind of take my own spin and my own style to add to things, which has been, I think, very helpful. That's cool. Yeah, and I think also to the curve is like I I didn't realize like how old I am, and like sometimes these students say things to me and I'm just like oh my god, <laughs> like, I, actually I am out ten years yeah it's yeah. Mm-hmm. It's funny too to come back to a campus like this that has undergrads like at UMass where I'm at our particular campus doesn't have any undergraduate oh, students okay. at all because it's only a graduate school. Okay. It's the medical school and the graduate school of nursing like that's all it is. Ah uh, okay. So you know we're on the the medical. Uh, university campus which, which houses like the UMass Memorial Medical Center okay so coming here I'm like oh my god they're all babies they're, they're little, I, and I love that like, I love teaching undergrads but they yeah. are so funny but I didn't feel like I was that young when I was that young but they're young and they and like this is Gen <laughs> Z and they they say what is on their mind yeah. and they don't care they don't care <laughs> which you know could be a very good uh, potentially a positive change yeah, depending yeah. on what it is you know <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one student, like, he, he told me he was handing in something late. I'm like, that's fine. Like, life happens. Um, and he's like, thank you, queen. I'm like, you know. <laughs> I'm like, it's fine. <laughs> like, you know, at least you respect me. I guess that's respect. Yeah. <laughs> They're funny. They're, I love the undergrads. They're so funny. That's funny. So one of the things I'm interested in, as you think about your teaching career mm-hmm. or your blossoming teaching career is, uh, and I, do you know Stephanie Griggs? By chance this yes she's at case western yes i be- was she here before at uconn um she was actually at umass umass she sounds very familiar she I does thought. sleep research um this sounds familiar she is she's very cool she's very smart uh th- she does these like really cool co-center models mm. of sleep that look at different oscillatory functions during sleep in peds actually oh um, three yeah i don't think she's <laughs> doing pain necessarily um but i'm sure that she's Interested, and then the inflammatory component would be really cool to study yeah. in conjunction with sleep. But it, I was chatting with her recently. I had her on the podcast like a few months ago. Okay. She was explaining to me that she has this pr- as she's gotten into this new faculty role too. She actually also has a K ninety nine, so okay. she's in the same boat you are. This is why I'm thinking about her and you in the same thought <laughs> process here. Um, as she becomes a new faculty. And you guys are both like learning to teach new, you know, new grads, uh, sorry, new nursing students. The thing that's kind of sticking out to her is that as we're losing kind of elder nurse researchers, Mm -hmm. we have to build up the kind of workforce, not only in nursing, but in nursing science. Yeah. Are you noticing in your teaching, like certain people or certain traits that are sticking out, like they might be really good at this? Or are there ways you're finding, like, I have to kind of try to prod people who I think would be really suitable for nursing? Like, how do you think yeah. about getting that next kind that of pipeline, wave, right? that yeah. pipeline? So, actually, UConn has a fantastic honors program, like I mentioned before. And actually, I'm speaking to the honors students tonight 
for that pipeline purpose because it's to get these kids engaged and interested in research. So, you know, in the course I taught, so like Nursing 101, basically, I kind of had them think of like, because they started to learn how to write kind of scientifically. So think of like one question that you want to answer. And we did like a quick lit review for them to just figure out how to do that. So it's just, I think, giving them those skills. You know, I don't think that there's one attribute that I can look at a student and be like, you know, you're going to be a really good researcher. Because mm-hmm. I doubt anyone can see that in me. Like I was just floundering um, around. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. Like I just want to pick classes first, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so I think it's really just exposing them to that. And then having students in the lab. So, like, I have quite a few students um, in the lab. Unfortunately, I don't have any nursing students. I'm trying to get nursing students and a lot of pre-med. Um, getting them involved in research and explaining to them, like, the pathways in research. But the honors program is a really good start um, in getting kids engaged in that because I'm pretty sure most honors programs in schools of nursing have a research component to mm. it. So I think that's kind of a good pipeline to start with. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I feel like there needs to be a pipeline for nurse scientists, but there also needs to be a pipeline for nursing science in practice, like in the hospitals, yeah. you know, with like facilitated, you know, by schools of nursing somehow. Like, yeah. That's a conversation we've had offline. We'll have to keep having. Um, and it's something that our generation of nurse researchers like yours and mine, if I can count myself in that category yet, are going to have to figure out because absolutely it, it seems to be a pressing problem to actually get clinical problems answered, mm-hmm. I think. Um, now I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> but... No, it is very true. Um, yeah. So I know we're kind of closing in on time because I know you have to go teach classes. Yes. <laughs> Speaking of a heavy teaching load. Yes. Um, tell me what you're looking forward to most in your next, say, like five years of research. I'm just looking most forward to helping families. like that. And I know that sounds so cliche, but like helping children and families and really just helping that recovery. And I know it takes a while for like research to kind of like get into practice, but really kind of sounding the alarm on the fact that like survival alone may not be the answer. And I think that really got, you know, attention during COVID, particularly in adult populations, not necessarily kids, but about the idea of post ICU recovery and post COVID and all those things. And there was post ICU clinics and we don't have that in pediatrics. And who knows if we need them? We don't know, right? Like, do we need them? Are they feasible? Do we just need to call these families, follow up and see how they're, do they just need social support? What do they actually need? And so that's what I'm really most interested in and excited about is finding out what these families need, what recovery looks like, and how can we help them throughout this recovery? Do you know, uh, it was published in the New England Journal. There was a study a few years ago. Oh God, God I know I'm showing my age. It was like a <laughs> decade ago. It was like a really famous post ICU look across five years at uh, disability after uh, ARDS. Mm -hmm. And I forget the name of the lead author. I did a podcast on it like two years ago when I was just looking at some critical care stuff. Like, maybe I'll want to be a critical care nurse. (laughs) Um, And, of course, they didn't really look at rehabilitation. They Mm -hmm. only looked at was there disability at five years. Mm -hmm. And perceived shortness of breath and all this stuff. It persisted for for years Mm -hmm. after Um, And this was only in adults. So, and there's obviously more funding in adults. There's more research that happens in adults in the ICU. So, like, I can imagine there's this dearth um, of evidence in the the peds world. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then, yeah, like, tying it back to how are these families coping? How are they recovering at home? Like, I think it's such an important area. I'm, like, really excited that you're doing the work you're doing. and. There's some yeah. great work right now coming out of um, the UK, actually, Joseph Manning, who's looking at oh, this. Um, he's got a study called Oceanic, and he's looking at siblings and the way siblings um, deal with uh, having a critically ill uh, sibling. Hmm. So it, there's a lot of cool work coming out right now. Um, and so I think the time is now for it. So post of care syndrome pediatrics, they call PIXP. Um, Martha Curley, like I mentioned from Penn, she's doing a study on it right now. Um, it's certainly a good time to, to be in that space. That's awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. So last question for mm-hmm. you. What advice do you have for kind of early career nurse investigators like myself, for yeah. example, being a little self-serving? Yeah. And <laughs> for nursing students in general who think they might be interested in what you do? Sure. Um, always ask questions and always reach out to people. Um, for example, my postdoc, I... Honestly, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, I just need a postdoc because I need to get back in that critical care arena. Dr. Curley on her site, it literally said not accepting postdocs. And I was like, okay. 
but I messaged her and I emailed her anyway and it worked out. So the worst thing people can tell you is no, right? So certainly ask questions, make those connections and get those mentors that you need. Fantastic. Yeah. Mallory, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you for having me.